All right. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Um, welcome uh, to this first um, jointly hosted Columbia and Ethereum Foundation workshop uh, on, cri on uh, crypto economics. Uh, I think it's going to be extremely exciting, extremely cutting edge. Um, this, is a, <clears throat> this is a little background. There's a one-day workshop meant to bring together researchers, um, practitioners, and academics to discuss challenges, recent progress, and opportunities in the economics of blockchain protocols with a particular emphasis on the problems currently faced by the Ethereum Foundation. We have really kind of amazing participation uh, from the Ethereum Foundation uh, in this event. And um, the, probably most of you already have the agenda. If you don't, you can um, find it here. Uh, the, the, every, the day is structured um, so that there's really a lot of opportunities for direct interaction um, between the different uh, types of communities that are here. Right? So speaking as a researcher right, in this space, it's actually very difficult to figure out what would be a good research problem without talking directly to the folks that are really you know, trying to build things, trying to get stuff um, out there and working in the world. And so uh, a lot of the schedule is designed to maximize the number of opportunities for the Columbia community and the broader sort of New York research community to learn as much as possible um, from the Ethereum Foundation and other, other folks building on, a, on Ethereum. So before lunch, we're going to have six talks. They'll be they're in sort of uh, thematically pa paired up. Uh, so two sessions before coffee break, then, then the third session. Um, those, we've asked the speakers to speak for about 20 minutes, leaving about 10 minutes um, for Q&A. So should there be a lot of time for interaction after the talks. There will also be another opportunity to interact with all of the morning speakers at a breakout session from 2.30 to 3 uh, this afternoon. So the two speakers from each of the sort of themes will lead a breakout session and sort of an uh, informal AMA uh, later in the afternoon. After the afternoon, we're also going to have a keynote uh, and a session of lightning talks, um, and then a panel led by, moderated by Justin Drake from the Ethereum Foundation on, on Ken Tradfi, um, help design Ethereum. Uh, put up here just some sort of, you know, common sense rules around, you know, silencing, you know, your devices. Um, bathrooms, if you exit the auditorium, you just go right inside this building, the down the hallway to the right. Um, all of the breaks and then the sort of uh, reception where we can all hang out. At the end of the day, that's all in Carlton Commons, which is the same place that you registered. So if you go out of this building, you go immediately to the left, and Carlton Commons is right there. So we're just going to be bouncing back and forth between this room um, and that room. Okay. Uh, so that's it for um, kind of logistics. So next I'd like to introduce Professor Shifu Chang. Um, so Shifu is the Dean of Columbia Engineering, uh, leading the education, research, and innovation mission uh, and execution of a strategic vision, Engineering for Humanity. Uh, he has contributed significantly to the growth and advancement of the school, propelling it to one of the top engineering programs in the nation. He received his bachelor's from National Taiwan University in 1985 and his PhD from UC Berkeley uh, in 1993. Um, he's the Morris A. and Alma Shapiro Professor with appointments in both electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, as one of the most influential experts in multimedia, computer vision, and artificial intelligence, his research has led to spin-off companies in licensed technology and multimedia search and recognition. The image search tools developed by his group have been used by law enforcement agencies in fighting online and human trafficking crimes. He has also developed AI tools for online disinformation detection uh, and attribution. Dean Chang, who we'll hear from next, uh, is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, the Association of Computing Machinery, the ACM, and IEEE, and an elected member of Academia Sinica. He, he receives the Kiyo uh, Tomiyasu Award from IEEE, the Honorary Doctorate from the University of Amsterdam, uh, and the Great Teacher Award from the Society of Columbia Graduates. He is also the inaugural director of uh, the Columbia Center of AI Technology in collaboration with Amazon, so I'm very uh, happy to welcome Dean Chang to give us some opening remarks today. Thank you. All right, let's just make a short remark. <clears throat> uh, welcome everyone, I'm Shifu Chen, uh, Dean of Columbia Engineering School of Engineering and Applied Science, and really thank you Tim and Siamak and Alexis in organizing today's event. We're just so happy we have the opportunity working with Ethereum Foundation and our sister school, Columbia Business School. Many of you probably from business school in Manhattan, your campus, sometimes we call uptown, but it's so close. <laughs> and uh, the blockchain and Web3 area is so exciting. There are so many student, faculty, researcher, and the community member interested in this area. Even for many of us, maybe have not traditionally followed in this area, given the recent news <laughs> of a discussion of this topic, I'm sure people are getting more curious and more excited about the opportunity and the challenges in this area. Hopefully you are not getting too involved in that topic. <laughs> and 
we actually, uh, engineering school recently launched a dual degree program between engineering school and business school. And it's a very ambitious goal, so we hope to train the students who are interested in learning the cutting edge emerging technology breakthrough, as well as the emerging business opportunity in the areas like blockchain in Web3 or this uh, decentralized data sharing and authentication and transparency. And as one of the pilot effort, the dean of the business school, Castis, uh, and myself taught a half semester course we call uh, Emerging Technology Breakthrough. And we chose six topics as Emerging Breakthrough. And blockchain and Web3 was one of the six, in including artificial intelligence also. And CMAC and Tim are both wonderful speakers talking to a group of students combined a mixture of a business school MBA students, as well as a master student from engineering school. It was a wonderful discussion. And from that pace and really excitement, enthusiasm of discussion about the new opportunities that can be enabled by the emerging technology platform like Web3, it's just so exciting. So it's not surprising to see we are organizing a special event like today to recontinue really to see the new opportunity and challenges issue in this area. <clears throat> and three years ago, Columbia and IBM also launched a center uh, focus on blockchain and data transparency. So that was uh, three years ago, and we focus on uh, developing a new curriculum, the new courses, new pedagogical tool, as well as a new research project. I, I think Tim and you, your colleague also has a, a project in that center, and it stimulates so much collaboration and new idea in this area. So I can see continuing that direction, that momentum of a discussion in the Web3 area. That will be discussed today. and. This fall in the uh, IEOR department, uh, Industrial Engineering Operating Research, Professor Agostino Capone, uh, in collaboration with uh, CIMAC in uh, Business School, is launching a very exciting seminar series called Digital Finance Area, and that will be focusing a lot in the blockchain and Web3 technology. So if you are interested in that seminar series, please let us know, or you can go on to the center website to receive the information. Our students are very busy also. We have one of the student group, group called Blockchain at Columbia. Any of the students here in that group? Yeah. <laughs> and, and really wonderful. You guys are really wonderful organizing the fantastic event and program. I think you launched a hackathon event, right, in April that has hundreds of students from many universities. And if I understand correctly, you are also the first student group that will be governed by a DAO, right? And, and hope, I'm very curious on how that uh, turned out to be and see if we can learn the lesson, how we can extend to different administrative function on the campus. So really exciting to see the focus of the research discovery of this workshop. I'm really looking forward to what will be coming out for further idea collaboration and wish you all have a wonderful productive workshop here today. Thank you, welcome again. Okay, thanks. And actually, just to, to add on to Dean Chang's, um, Dean Chang's comments, you know, I, I traveled to a lot of different universities, and I'm not going to name any names, but let's just say there's some variance in how um, interested different universities are in sort of uh, supporting research on this topic. And Columbia, my experience here, I've been here four years, experience has been amazing. Just there's always been, you know, any time I sort of suggest or my colleagues suggest kind of an opportunity of how to get more deeply involved and committed to the space, we've always just gotten immediate support both on the engineering school side and on the business school side. So I think speaking for my Columbia colleagues, we really don't, don't take that for granted. So, oops. All right, so let's, uh, let's kick off with the first um, pair of talks. Our, our first speaker is gonna be Barnaby Monod from the Ethereum Foundation. Barnaby, if you wanna come up, great. And I should say, so, so Dean Chang mentioned a new seminar series joint between engineering and business schools. And actually, Barnaby is going to be the speaker in that uh, on Monday, Monday at 545. So if you're still in town um, and you want to hear more from Barnaby, that's a great way to do it. Hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Columbia, for the invitation and for organizing the workshop with us. Uh, I think there's really some very interesting questions and I'm really excited to talk about them today. Uh, for the next 20 minutes, I'll give you an overview of proposal-builder separation, which is something I've been working on uh, at the Ethereum Foundation for some time. I'm a researcher at the Robust Incentives Group, which is a research team looking mostly at mechanism design and game theory. Um, yeah, so 
we have questions after the talk, but feel free to ask questions during as well if there's something that's um, unclear. I'll start the timer. So today I want to give a brief introduction to block construction in Ethereum, just to try and set the stage for this talk and perhaps some other talks of, of the day. Um, after that, I'll move on to proposal builder separation, which is a new paradigm that we've been investigating now for some time. Uh, it's already somewhat live on chain. There are mechanisms that um, do proposal builder separation today. So I'll talk a bit about them in this uh, practice of PBS. And then I'll give you some arguments for how we think about proposal builder separation in theory, um, especially when we think about it to move into the protocol, for instance. And finally, I will end with uh, w how does PBS fit in the cosmology of other protocol changes and other things that are happening uh, in Ethereum and giving some links to other talks that are taking place this morning. So let's start with block construction in Ethereum. Okay, this is a very simple slide. Uh, I, I just thought it would be nice to all have all be on the same page. What is a blockchain? It's a, it's a data structure, it's a chain of blocks. And the blocks contain two types of information. They contain some consensus data. So for instance, in proof of work, you just have a hash of a previous block and the nonce. And then they contain a list of executable transactions. So the blocks are linked together by this hash. And you can sort of think of it as these two layers. You have the consensus layer, which records all of the information that has to do with how nodes figure out what the correct head of a chain is, or the tip, or what's finalized and what's not. And then you have the execution layer, which is the transactions and the state of the chain. How it works today in, in proof of stake Ethereum is to make a block, you have to be a validator. And to be a validator, you have to deposit 32 ETH in the staking contract. So it's a smart contract that's deployed on chain. Once you deposit that, you wait for some time, and then you get activated, and you can start participating in consensus formation and block production. So every 12 seconds, there's a new opportuni opportunity to, to make a block. So one of the many validators is sampled uh, from the set. And when you make a block, you have to make your block based on the two layers, consensus and execution. First, you'd include votes from the previous committees that help people figure out what the correct head of a chain is. And then you also make what we call an execution payload that contains the transactions that the users have sent to you. So in the most naive, um, let's say, format, as a validator, you run these two pieces of software, the consensus client and the execution engine. Consensus client takes care of signing your block and figuring out the consensus data. The execution engine is strictly concerned with the payload and the user transactions. And so you're listening to some kind of mempool, you're receiving transactions from the user, and based on that, you, you make your block. The chart looks a bit empty because I'll add more to, to this chain um, in, the, in the next few slides. Let's talk a bit more about how block proposers make the execution payload. So they are free to include whatever transactions they see in their mempool. Typically, they would include any and all transactions that are fee paying, but they might decide to exclude some or to build their block differently. So there's no really enforcement of inclusion or ordering constraints in the block, except for one constraint, which is that transactions included in your block on Ethereum need to pay the EIP-1559 base fee. So EIP-1559 is a fee market reform that um, imposes a protocol-specified minimum price for the transactions that you include in your block. So as long as the transactions pay at least the base fee, you're safe and free to, to include them. Other than this constraint, you can build your block however you want. What we see, or what we saw, is that block producers would typically order their transactions in decreasing order of gas price. So the more fee-paying fee transaction is, the higher it is in the block. This is roughly incentive compatible because the first spot in the block, so the first transaction that can act upon the state left by the previous block, it, it has a lot of value. It allows you to, to have this first look and first interaction with the, with the state of the blockchain. So for instance, you can capture to arbitrage, you can, react, you be, you can be the first to react uh, to market events. And because this spot has a lot of value, it's somewhat incentive compatible to order these transactions by decreasing gas price so that you incentivize users who really want that spot to, to pay more for it. This is something that Phil Diane, uh, the next speaker, has looked at 
in, in much depth. And this is a, a plot here from his landmark Flash Boys 2.0 paper. You can see that it's two bots are competing to, to raise their gas prices over time so that they get that first slot in the block. And, and these, what we call gas price auctions, were very widespread on chain uh, before Flashbots uh, went live. What this tells us is that ordering matters. There's value to acting upon some state of the world on chain. And because the proposer controls that state transition via the transactions that they include, and they are free also to include their own transactions, uh, because the proposer controls that state transitions, they are the best place to realize this value. So I, I, I denote it as the value of some state S is the value of the transactions that executed on the state S. So for instance, if I can execute a transaction while an arbitrage exists, maybe that's worth a million dollars to me. But if I execute the same transaction after the arbitrage is gone, the transaction would likely fail, and the value for me is zero. So there's high non-linearity non in, in this value function of, of how, how, you, how you value this. But the person who's best placed to, to capture this, this value is the proposer. So the proposers in proof of work were called miners, and we know this as uh, minor extractable value, although it was now renamed to maximal extractable value because we, we speak of proposers or, or validators. And so let's talk about PBS in, in practice. So based on this landscape of, okay, there's value on chain that the, that the proposer can extract, how, do, how does this extraction happen? So in proof of work, because the top of block state has a lot of values, and because we had these priority gas auctions which are quite inefficient, like they put a lot of strain on the mempool, they don't really allow people to express that, okay, I want this uh, part of the block at, at that price. Um, we move to a system where you have searchers, which are a new entity in the chain, that bid for what we call bundle inclusion at the top of a block. So they make their bundle by taking a user transaction and adding maybe an arbitrage of their own uh, to the transactions. And they say that bundle is worth this amount um, to me. So you had this private auction between the block proposers and the searchers. So the searchers come to the proposers with their bundles. They say, I will pay you this much if you can include my bundle. Uh, and, and that relationship in proof of work really relied on trust. When, when the searcher comes to the proposer with their bundle, they trust that the proposer won't just copy paste the bundle, but replacing the searcher's address with the proposer's address. So effectively stealing um, the arbitrage from the, from the searcher. And so we had that uh, chain of, uh, of transaction. This paradigm doesn't really work in proof of stake. And the reason is that now in proof of stake Ethereum, we have a lot of solo validators, so validators who don't propose blocks very often. In proof of work, you, most of the miners were organized under mining pools, so it was easy to trust the mining pools because they're reputable entities, or at least they have some reputation and skin in the game. But because of these solo validators, you, you can't really rely on, okay, I don't know who's the person in front of me, and I don't know that they are going to steal uh, this profitable arbitrage that I'm telling them how to, how to make. And so you can't do this sending the bundles in the clear. And so one idea that uh, came up as we were moving to proof of stake is instead to receive full blocks from builders. So the proposer has no agency in terms of how the block is made. They just know that someone else is making the block for them. And by the time the block is made, the proposer can't do anything about it. So they can't steal the contents of the block and profit by themselves. And now we have we introduce this uh, new entity, which is uh, builders that sort of aggregate both user transactions that are pending and also bundles that searchers are, are sending them. The way this is done today is via MevBoost, which is a piece of software that Flashbots has developed. Uh, it's an out-of-protocol solution for external block building. With MevBoost, the proposer commits to using a builder block without seeing the content. And so what happens is between the builder and the proposer, there is another entity that is called the relay that is sort of brokering that relationship. So the relay receives blocks from the builder the relay validates that the block is indeed valid, that the transactions in there are not uh, invalid EVM transaction, and also validates that the builder bid. So what the builder says 
they are going to pay to the proposer for the right to, to include their block, uh, that this bid is indeed going to be paid uh, properly. So the relay gets that block, forwards only the bid to the proposer, and the proposer sort of blind signs based on what they receive in this auction. So whatever highest bid they get uh, from the relays, they, they sign that and they commit to releasing that specific block once the relay receives the, the signed bid. It's a system that's quite efficient and we notice that today already 90% of the validator set has opted in to, to use this uh, MethBoost software instead of building their blocks locally. And so this is what it looks like uh, today in proof of stake, the, the full chain of, of things, um, the transactions from the users all the way to the, to the block production. Um, so you can still see that, of course, the option of locally building your block is there on, on the left, uh, but via the relays and, and via the MethBoost piece of software, the validators are able to completely outsource block production to this external chain of out-of-protocol uh, actors. So that's how PBS is done today on chain. Um, since it's so systemic, since 90% of the validator set is, is using uh, such facilities, it's normal to ask whether there are systemic risks or whether there are things where we can improve on as a, as a protocol. And so now I want to give some arguments uh, or, or maybe a sense of a question that we're not faced with and that we're trying to, to find out for, for PBS. So the first thing uh, I got this plot from uh, John Charbonneau is this is kind of the, the ideal, let's say, economics of PBS that because you have this chain of agents, so searchers and builders and proposers, at every step of the chain, people are trying to compete to give away as much value as possible to upstream. So the searchers receive these bundles, they make the bundles, but they're trying to, to, to bid away as much of a value as possible so that they are selected by the builder. The builder is trying to bid away as much of a value as possible to be selected by the proposer. And so whatever value really exists in that block should somehow trickle down all the way to the, to the proposers. And the proposers, they're just fairly passive. They accept uh, the highest bid that they receive. So you notice that in that chain, uh, there's no relays in there. And so maybe the first thing we can do um, as, a, as a protocol is trying to remove one of the choke points or one of the entities that is, that is in that chain so that the system as a whole is a bit more secure. So instead of having relays intermediate the relationship between uh, builders and proposers, we can just have builders communicate directly to proposers via the protocol in the, in the middle. And so one way to think about this is that doing PBS is really doing two things at the same time. So PBS, I think of it as both a market structure and an allocation mechanism. So the market structure is the idea that with PBS, we're outsourcing parts of the block construction to, to, to outside parties. Why this makes sense? Because there's somewhat an asymmetry between the cost of block construction and the cost of block verification. So to make a really good block that has a lot of value, you see that there's this very sophisticated chain of actors that are building the block progressively, aggregating these different bundles and, and transactions. That's a very complex process. But once the block is made, it's very easy for the rest of the network to, to, to verify that the block is, is indeed valid. And so because there is this asymmetry, we can move to this market structure where we can let other parties make this one-shot complex process of making the block and then have a network uh, verify that um, let's say more easily or, or in a time that, that is very low or at low cost. So that's the idea of PBS um, as a market structure. And then once we, once we decide that, okay, this paradigm is something that is an opportunity and that we can probably take advantage of, we have to figure out what's the best way to, to organize this market or what exactly is the market on? What good is the, is the market selling? So what exactly does the proposer outsource uh, as part of their block construction. And here, I find that there's a lot of ways that we can do PBS, and so it's a little unclear, or, or maybe we need more arguments to, to decide what's reasonable to do or to bake into the, into the protocol. The, the first idea is to simply take the design of MethBoost, which is the whole block auction, where the proposer sells off 
entirely their rights to, to make the block. But instead of having the relay intermediate the relationship, uh, the protocol is now the broker. So when the builder sends you a bid, the bid is binding, whether they make a valid block or not. So the bids are understood by the protocol as, as meaningful. Um, and the consequence is that you remove the relays from the system, and even if you have a failure uh, of a builder to, to deliver the good once they were committed to do it, or if they deliver a good that is not right, like if the block is invalid, uh, the proposer still has a guaranteed payment. So that allows the protocol to sort of backstop this external relationship between the proposer and the outside parties that they are interacting with. But even at that level, there are different ways that we can do this. So for instance, uh, we've been thinking about whether the proposer should organize the auction around specific block contents or whether the auction should be only to sell the right to make a block. So by that I mean, do the builder need to commit to certain block content before they send you their bid? Or does the builder commit only after sending the bid to what the block contents are? So that's one of the design decisions that we have. So for that this slot auction where the builder gets the right to make the block but doesn't tell you what the contents are yet. Uh, that can be, for instance, a more flexible way to, to do PBS in protocol. But we have to decide uh, whether block or slot auction is, is the right one. Another issue with PBS is something that economists are fam familiar with, which is the principal agent problem, that whenever you outsource uh, something to, to a third party, your preferences as the principal, they might not be respected by the, by the agent, so the person who's doing uh, the thing on your behalf. Here, for instance, a property that we are missing because the builder set is, is more centralized. When we have a very decentralized set of block proposers, we have very good properties of censorship resistance. But if there are very few builders making the blocks on behalf of the block proposers, and if these builders decide that they don't want some transactions to enter into their block, we lose that property from outsourcing uh, block production. And so here, some ideas to reestablish a bit of balance between the, the builders and the proposers is to let the proposer inject some input into, into block construction. So we don't just sell off the entire right to make the block. We say, okay, you can make the block, but conditional to either these transactions being included or your block has to be full. So that's the idea of inclusion lists. Or we can have other systems where the proposer makes one part of the block and another part is outsourced to the builder, what we call partial block auctions. And so here again, we have some leeway in deciding what is the correct mechanism to, to, to enshrine into the protocol. So now I want to finish with a bit of opening up PBS to, to, to the larger space of, of protocol changes that, that, we, that we're considering. The first one is builders for data availability. So Ethereum is moving to a world where the protocol at the base layer will provide a lot of data availability, which is a resource that is very important to layer two scaling solutions. And here again, we have this asymmetry that we can provide very big blocks, like a lot of data availability at one time, um, and verifying it is very simple. So we can have a builder aggregate together a lot of data from, from the rollups in one shot, while the rest of the network is able to, to verify that the data is available in a, in a very cheap way. So we can leverage this idea of outsourcing block construction to a third party, the builder, uh, to provide this data availability resource. Um, yeah, so this is the idea of Deng sharding, and Dankrad will be talking about this um, in, the, in the second session. Another big question that I have is the incentive compatibility of PBS. So I'm trying to understand whether the PBS bid, as received by the proposer, is actually an objective oracle of the, of the block value. Um, the proposer, in a sense, is, is running an auction when they are outsourcing uh, the production of their block. And we, we, when we have these auctions in protocol or when we have these auctions that are run in this decentralized environment, we have to ask ourselves, uh, you know, is there the possibility that the auctioneer is not credible? And if the auctioneer is not credible, they can take bribes, they can enter into side contracts with other parties, and they can try to mess up the game so that they 
are rewarded more. And I think there's a lot of questions around the, the incentive compatibility of PBS. And some of these questions I find look a bit like the questions what we had when we were thinking about uh, EIP 1559. And I, and I think uh, Elaine's talk might shed some light on, on some of these questions too. And finally, there's PBS also from the user perspective. So in, in, in all the things I've said, uh, I've told you that PBS is, is sort of an optimizer for pro proposer value. So you have this trickle down of value. So you're, you're really trying to optimize the value that the proposer receives. But we know that this value is not always to the user's benefit. For instance, if the user is sandwiched or if there are failed trades, uh, these are things that the proposer receives as value, but you know it's, it's not right. So the user originates this proposer extractable value. Why isn't it possible for the user to, to capture it or to at least protect themselves? So how do we ensure that the value extraction along that chain is a bit uh, better than, than a simple optimizer? So we have many tools. We have cryptography. We have ways to make credible commitments. We have things like game warping, changing the incentives of the different players at different levels. Uh, and I hope that Phil can tell us a, a bit more about this. That's it for me. Thank you all for listening. Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, how do block builders value uh, the right to make a block in the future? So essentially, could we sell block space futures to the block builders? Is that, yeah. So when I was making that distinction between the block and the slot auction, when since the slot auction, you can think of it as a block space future that is one block ahead. So you, you sell the right to make the block and you like the next one who makes that block. The question is, can we do that for more with a higher look ahead? Like, can we, as a protocol, sell block space futures that maybe, you know, I sell you the right to make the block 10 slots in advance uh, to, the, to that slot? I think it's possible. Uh, the question is whether it's something that we want. Um, if, if you don't have it in protocol, it's possible that an out of protocol market will form around a cartel of builders that somehow are able to enter into these agreements and promise one another that they honor uh, these block space futures. So I think there's a real tension between, yeah, whenever you have a feature that's not in protocol, out of protocol markets are going to, to come about and, and, uh, and take that spot. And, uh, and I, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about this a bit. Uh, I have a post online, if you, if you find it on my Twitter, where I discuss that point a, a bit more. There are ways I think that the protocol can do it. The question is more, do we allow it at the protocol level? Yeah. And what are the arguments for, for allowing it? One, I guess one input that would be interesting and that we've tried to look at a bit more is what would be the delta of value from allowing these, these types of things? So what, what more value can we unlock from having access to these, to these types of block space future? And if that value is not too high, maybe it's not such a huge loss, but if that value is very significant, then maybe we want to think about um, having that as a, as a feature. Yes? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question too. So I... Oh, uh, how can we make sure that good MEV makes it into the block and bad MEV doesn't? And that's indeed like something that I was uh, making a reference to here is that I would say from the protocol's perspective, we can definitely provide things such as privacy or encryption that allow transactions to go through that chain maybe unharmed. Um, but we can't do a lot more. Like we can't enforce that only certain types of transactions go through and not others. We, we are running a generic, I would say, Turing machine. And so we can't really make conditions on, okay, only these transactions can get in. So 
our hands are a bit tied at the protocol. I think we can do things well, such as designing this VBS as this optimizer of value, and then hope that from the user side, so from the transaction perspective, uh, there are ways to, to protect the user. And I think these solutions will be out of protocol rather than in. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, that's a very good question too, and I think. It, oh, uh, sorry. Um, so, it, if we are able to sell block space futures, we might get into a world where we increase the centralization pressures of builders, I guess, because they are more sophisticated. They are better able to take advantage of these futures. They are better at risk management. So we sort of tilt the game towards uh, entities that are more sophisticated. So we just increase centralization of the, of the block building process. But on the other hand, the opportunity is that by selling these futures, we, we just unlock more value. Because there is economic value to knowing in advance that you can do something, we unlock more value, and this value is, is MEV. Uh, and so how do we make the trade-off between increasing centralization and uh, unlocking this extra value? Was that? OK, I just, yeah. And so I. I do think that we need more arguments on where's the boundary of a protocol. In my opinion, we, we need to make sure that the protocol doesn't give away or, or, or is able to capture as much of a value as it can, because I think these futures will exist either at protocol level or out of protocol. If they are out of protocol, there's going to be agents that are going to capture it uh, outside of it. So. Yeah, it's it's a difficult trade-off to make, and I don't think it's, it's definitely not the Ethereum Foundation who will make that trade-off. I think it's we're we're trying to provide more arguments of research and uh, and understanding really the landscape and what's out there, and then being able to to decide, yeah, what exactly we want to to have as as protocol features. Yeah. Thank you. Test, test, test. All right, hello everybody. My name is Phil. I am a steward of a project called Flashbots, as well as a PhD student at Cornell. Um, a disclaimer here, two disclaimers about my slide deck, or three, I guess. Number one, uh, I missed the memo about the QA, so this is a 45 minute deck I was gonna give in 30 minutes, and now we're gonna have to do it in 25. So I uh, hope you had your coffee. I know I had like four. Um, the second disclaimer is if you were in Colombia at DevCon, you may have already seen a lot of these slides, but there's some new stuff for you at the end. So if you were going from Colombia to Colombia, I apologize, uh, but please uh, bear with us here. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about Suave, which is a system we're building in Flashbots, recently announced, how it relates to the general MEV problem and we're gonna talk about some trillion dollar questions. So this is gonna be kind of a three part presentation. Um, the first one's gonna talk about what is MEV? What is this meme, this buzzword I've been hearing so much about? Uh, where did it come from? The second is gonna talk about where we are today. So what have we kind of done in the past? What have we built? What still needs to be done? And the third is gonna be about the future. So what is our goal for the MEV and uh, kind of uh, crypto economic design community? What is Flashbots doing to pursue these goals? and how can we all do it together? Um, so this kind of uh, uh, 
not all started. Uh, if you want to see history of how MEV all started, there's some other talks about that I'm happy to point you to. But all took off for me with this paper that we wrote um, out of Cornell called Flash Boys 2.0, uh, where we looked at the kind of market structure for Ethereum mempool options for arbitrage opportunities and other forms of ordering and latency sensitive transactions. Um, and to do this, we actually measured the market. We, just, we deployed a bunch of uh, infrastructure throughout the world, took very fine-grained latency measurements on the P2P network, um, plotted auction data for various types of opportunities, and mapped kind of both profit and the data behind the auctions that were being played on chain. And we had a game theoretic model that predicted um, how the future of this market would play out. Um, and we actually did, after the paper was published, see things converge to that model. So highly recommend this paper uh, if you're interested in where MEV came from. Uh, but this is the paper that kind of mentions this meme for the first time. And uh, it's described in the paper as one case. So th this thing called OO, or ordering optimization fees, are described as one case of a more general quantifiable value uh, we call minor extractable value, or MEV, now again renamed to maximal extractable value. And that refers to the total amount of ether uh, miners can extract from manipulation of transactions within a given time frame while they're leaders of the protocol, uh, which may include multiple blocks worth of transactions. Um, so before MEV was MEV in that paper, it was energy in physics, uh, mega electron volts in this case, or micro, depending on your capitalization. Um, but MEV, in, in, as defined in Flash Boys 2.0, more generally kind of represents this financial potential energy that's exposed in blockchains from the state of the world, the past actions in consensus, um, as well as the kind of available actions in the present and the degrees of freedom around things like what transactions have been signed. Um, so in this paper, we talk about how MEV poses concrete measurable security risks to the protocol, show that it could destabilize Ethereum consensus today. Um, but really what MEV is and the way it was designed is as a nerd snipe. So I don't know if you all are familiar with this comic from XKCD. Uh, but uh, basically nerd snipes are kind of problems that look appealing and solvable to many people but in fact lead you into this kind of infinite rabbit hole of bike shedding and uh, convoluted thought and, and kind of never exiting the nerd snipe to the point where you're walking across the street and you get run over by a truck. Um, and that's what MEV is kind of intended to be. It was kind of intended to nerd snipe people who are kind of complexity researchers or uh, numerical optimization people or AI researchers or other forms of kind of uh, mathematicians by giving this clear formula that encapsulates in a single integer uh, kind of the entire uh, financial potential energy of Ethereum and of these uh, discrete computable financial systems we're building. Um, this is actually a very unique property of this kind of consensus system. Okay, so that's where MEV comes from. Uh, so what are we doing about MEV? So as a researcher, you know, uh, what I suggest to you in MEV is really as you're getting nerd sniped to try to play the long game here and think 10, 15, or 20 years out um, because the MEV is complex and there's a lot of short-term incentives around it. Um, so in my efforts to do this, it kind of became clear uh, in, in the early days of exploring MEV that there needed to be some sort of effort or entity uh, that was working on MEV products as well as research that was aligned with the concepts of decentralization and cryptocurrency. Uh, why? Because MEV is a huge centralization vector. There's a lot of hedge funds, a lot of people, a lot of entities that want to centralize MEV to themselves so they can benefit from the financial system. And I think it risks kind of destroying the decentralization of crypto, which is why we're all here, why we're all able to sit in this room and kind of have conversations as peers on how to design these things. Um, so decentralization is the real value proposition of these systems for humanity. And we have to make sure that these financial incentives don't end up too centralizing, which means we have to manage them intelligently. Um, so as part of this journey, I uh, co-founded with a bunch of people and currently steward this project called Flashbots, which I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and this project has three goals the, uh, as it was founded. Um, the first goal is to illuminate the dark forest. So MEV has been described as this dark forest. I don't know if you all are three body problem fans, but the meme is from there. Um, basically this kind of dark, unknown, scary uh, kind of region of uncertainty full of, full of evil creatures that just want to kind of eat your lunch, um, which is kind of what the Ethereum mempool is and was for a long time. So we want to illuminate this because we believe that the in, in, transparency is necessary to achieving the rest of the goals of decentralization. We also want to democratize MEV extraction. So 
uh, centralization, vertical integration, um, centralization of the validator set, these are all problems that we want to avoid by having a permissionless market that people can access and participate in for MEV. And we want to distribute MEV benefits. So this is the thing that uh, Barnabé was talking about. We want to make sure that the users are the benefits of MEV. Um, side note, because I heard someone say it earlier, good and bad MEV, sandwich attacks, find me later and let's have like a two hour conversation about that because I think uh, you know, in two years, users will want to be sandwiched. That's my spicy take right here. Um, okay, so where are we today? By the way, I didn't mention all these pictures are from the dark forest where I live. So uh, pictures while doing MEV research are, are a big part of my own emotional regulation. So thanks for humoring me. Um, so where are we today? We've had the merge. We've had several iterations of Flashbot software that aim to kind of democratize MEV by making it available to everyone to participate in these markets permissionlessly. Um, after the merge, we moved to a system called MevBoost, which involves outsourcing, as Barnabé covered, the kind of full block construction to this network of relayers, builders, uh, and searchers. Um, and MEV Boost has been quite successful. So a lot of these stats are old. I'll call them out when they're not old. I was kind of too lazy to update the deck from one month ago, so forgive me. Uh, but at this point, we're looking at MEV Boost uh, building uh, or being connected to more than 95% of the Ethereum network's uh, validation power. And I don't remember what the latest block stats were, but it's somewhere in like the 80, 90% range of blocks are produced by MEV Boost. Um, and uh, there's a few active relays on the MEV Boost system, including Flashbots, but also many others. Um, so before MEV Boost, Flashbots kind of had a vertically integrated client, which was intended to democratize access to MEV for searchers. Now we've introduced competition at the kind of Flashbots layer by creating this neutral infrastructure for other parties like Flashbots to use. Um, so you can see MEV Boost after the merge, um, highly kind of successful, and also a good increase in validator payments. So you're seeing often um, up to 100% or more of payments that validators are getting from block rewards coming through MEV payments from searchers and other um, MEV actors. So how well are we doing at our goals as Flashbots? Well, let's talk about the first one, which is illuminating the dark forest. Um, we have a very strong culture of data at Flashbots. So um, as you could see, a lot of MEV in the early days was illuminated by the Flashpoise 2.0 paper, and Flashbots intends to kind of carry that culture forward by providing open data to the community, as well as providing data dashboards and other ways for the community to have transparency um, and, and kind of access this very complex ecosystem. Not only that, but we've inspired many of our competitors, uh, Western Gate, Jito, Skip, Zero MEV, and many more uh, with our first product, MEV Explorer, which was an MEV dashboard. And in fact, like these days, if you see a new project in the MEV space, highly likely they'll do a dashboard first, uh, which is something we're very proud of. Um, we also have rich public data for MEV Boost, so uh, open APIs for relay data that you can dive into as a researcher and research kind of the, the market structure of MEV Boost. Um, and we hope that we can kind of continue this uh, culture through all future Flashbots versions. Um, and the, one of the most important things, and this is the biggest font in my whole presentation, is that you can't illuminate without research. So at Flashbots, uh, we are a dual R&D engine. We do a lot of research uh, in-house, and you can see in almost any uh, research workshop focused on MEV or anything like that, you'll notice Flashbots talks, papers, uh, blog posts, data, et cetera. So we're a strong believer in doing research as a first-class citizen and without kind of serving product incentives exclusively, um, and we're structured in a way that kind of protects that academic freedom. Um, and a recent kind of byproduct of this is a blog post we published just a few days ago, which I highly recommend you check out, called The Cost of Resilience. So this is about censorship in the MevBoost system and how to build a more robust, competitive MevBoost market while not foregoing uh, profits as much as possible and ensuring that the penalty for uh, kind of upholding honest values is minimized. Um, so highly recommend that read from Flashbots Research. All right, what about democratization? Well, in terms of democratization, I claim that there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so one of the biggest memes around Flashbots and MEV in general is this kind of uh, OFAC censorship uh, relay kind of choke point uh, issue, which we can discuss uh, at length in the sessions after, so find me if you're interested in this. Um, but this is certainly an issue. Uh, people have noticed that some of the large relays and builders, including Flashbots, um, do exclude transactions which are on the kind of sanctioned list uh, of addresses published by the US government. 
And people are afraid this could lead to censorship or non-inclusion of transactions or a loss of neutrality for the entire Ethereum network as a whole. Um, and I think Flashbots has started to mitigate this, but there's a lot of kind of work left to do. So how do you actually mitigate this? How do you achieve robustness? Uh, my view is that you don't achieve robustness by kind of forcing people to comply with your opinion of what is the right ordering and what is the right inclusion and what is the right exclusion of transactions to make, but you design a system that has meta-level properties that are kind of robust to and, and beyond the individual choice of any validator. So as a researcher, I think about censorship resistance as a guarantee of um, you know, fairly timely inclusion, not necessarily a guarantee you'll be included exactly in the position you want. Um, and it's important that we build properties uh, on the system level that basically use the diversity of people's utility functions and regulatory compliance preferences and et cetera to build a whole that's greater than the sum of all its parts. Um, so that's kind of the efforts that we're going through um, at Flashbots. So as you can see here, you know, there are a lot of kind of red blocks, which are blocks that are mined according to infrastructure enforcing this policy, but there's also a lot of blocks that aren't. Um, and currently, there, there are not, just to be clear, transactions being excluded from the chain. Um, so what are we doing about these issues and how are we building a more robust system? What's the first step we're taking? Well, we open source, uh, we open source almost all of our infrastructure. So this is our first step towards encouraging global, diverse, uh, robust competition, is to make sure that we minimize the barrier to entry to every aspect of this stack. So we have both open source relay and recently open source builder infrastructure that you can spin up out of the box and participate in the MEV network in a, in a competitive manner. Um, and you can see that the effect of these actions, so you know the, the, the builder, uh, or sorry, the relay being open sourced somewhere here and the builder being open sourced kind of right in the beginning of that green region there is already having an effect on uh, bringing kind of competition and robustness to the network. But there's a lot of work left to do here. So despite kind of the falling block percentages of, and, and, and less kind of uh, dominated uh, market by the Flashbots builder, um, there is kind of a lot of work to do. We want to see a really healthy, permissionless, robust, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network um, take the place of Flashbots while preserving the decentralization of the base layer and the validator and making sure people have access to the kind of MEV revenue uh, that, that the system generates. So I claim here that the only way out of this is through the dark forest. So we have to go on a journey through the dark forest together and the incentives and the path will be complicated, but it's okay because we will eventually make it out. Um, another thing we are doing as Flashbots is engaging in policy um, and engaging in kind of uh, legal work to clarify and to work with our partners across the industry to talk about uh, what actually is a sane framework for blockchains. How do you think about regulating all of these layers of these complex systems we're building? Um, how do you ensure you don't destroy innovation or decentralization um, as a side effect of consumer protection? So these are big questions we're happy to jam or work with you on and expect to also see more public uh, events from us on this stuff soon. Okay, so that's illuminate and democratize. The last thing I promised we do as Flashbots is distribute the MEV. So how are we doing on that? Um, well, so one kind of user-facing product we do have is called Flashbots Protect. Uh, this is a private transaction product. It basically uh, creates bundles for users of their transactions that are sent directly uh, to builders um, uh, and kind of protected from the validator seeing and front running or other entities seeing or front running these transactions. Um, that being said, we could do a lot more. So I think this is the part that Flashbots so far has released the fewest products along, uh, but also the one we plan to be the most active in uh, going forward um, uh, is the user facing side. So there's a lot to do, uh, slow progress. So far we've been focused on avoiding centralization of the validator set, which I think has been quite successful. We do today see a permissionless uh, kind of open MEV marketplace. We're not seeing a lot of validator vertical integration at the moment with builders and relays even. Um, and so uh, we are proud of the work we've done there, but we have to do a lot more to kind of make sure users can see the benefits um, of MEV and of the MEV they generate. Okay, so what is the actual market structure? Um, where is this market going and how do you think about uh, MEV and how do you think about what we need to work on? How do we iterate this market? 
So this is kind of a more product focused uh, or, or short to medium term focused slide than a, than a long term focused slide. Um, but this is how I think about the MEV marketplace roughly um, in structure and how um, uh, the things I would like to change uh, about it in the future. So on the left, you have the user that's generating transactions. They're the ones that make the MEV. They make the MEV by signing things. Uh, the things they sign have value. And on the right, you have the validator. They want to maximize the value they extract. Uh, they have a slot. They're a leader. They have some capital. They're providing some security. There's some financial data associated with the packets they're processing, and they want to be paid as much as possible because they're rational. Um, so on the left, the user wants to minimize MEV. And that's actually kind of like a little bit of a red herring. It's not exactly minimize. But they want to make sure that MEV is aligned with their preferences of execution, um, that they're paying the fees that they're OK with, that they can predict, and that they're comfortable paying, that they're not getting kind of predatorily rent extracted, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they want to minimize the amount that they're paying to the validator while having their preferences satisfied, essentially. And the validator wants to kind of maximize this. So this is a natural market. You, you, it's a two-sided marketplace. You see this uh, all the time, and actually very amenable to you know, all sorts of game-based simulations, given, given the structure. Um, so what do we need to do for this market from where it is today? Well, one thing is we need to make it more private. So this is one of my big memes going forward. We'll talk about this in a sec. But we need to make sure that we use privacy. Uh, a lot of the value that users are providing here is an in information value. And privacy and private cryptographic systems and adding privacy to mechanism design allows them to have more negotiation leverage in this marketplace and capture more of their value and uh, more of their rent. Um, it has to be more decentralized, right? So we still want to make sure that the validator set stays decentralized. That's super important, again, for humanity, that we keep that set decentralized. Um, so we want to keep decentralizing at every step the market and avoid steps towards centralization as much as possible. We want more competition, more global permissionless competition uh, for the reasons we mentioned before, to make sure everyone's utility function has a chance to be expressed in the kind of ledger. Uh, we want more transparency, so more illumination of the dark forest. Um, people can only make informed decision when, when they have information. And we want to avoid kind of information hazards and things like that, principal agent problems. Um, we want more user tooling. So we want users to be able to minimize their MEV effectively. We want them to be able to estimate and predict what execution they're going to get, reason about it, uh, leverage their negotiating power and their economic output. Uh, we obviously want it to be more robust and efficient, right? So we want it to be uh, resilient to even extreme economic situations, even collapses of things like stable coins, even uh, attacks by nation state level actors or things like that. We want an extremely robust marketplace, and that requires efficiency if you're going to design that in a rational uh, model. Uh, we want it to be more geographically diverse, so this is extremely important. This is, other than privacy, the number one meme I want you to take away is geographic diversity. Um, why? Because if we end up building centralizing decisions into our systems and we end up with systems that incentivize geographic centralization, such as Solana or like many others we've seen, anything latency sensitive, for example, uh, what we're going to end up seeing is capture by single regulatory regimes, by single infrastructure points, et cetera. So if we believe in decentralization, we need geographic diversity. And this is the first cut we should take on any protocol is saying, does this preserve the geographic diversity that we've built so far, or does it make things worse? Uh, we want fewer externalities on the user. So MEV comes with a lot of externalities on people who aren't generating or extracting MEV, for example, reorg attacks. Um, censorship, spam, et cetera, et cetera. Block space increases, as we've seen in 2017 and 2018. Um, you know, backdoor futures, a la gas token, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to minimize these network externalities for L1. And we want to preserve the fewer first party deals with validators. So still, the guiding star is like first party deals with validators are the worst. Why? Because it privileges validators able to make these first party deals. It relies on the legal system for enforcement. It threatens the very nature of decentralization, and it turns crypto more into TradFi. So we really, really want to avoid these first party deals. OK, so how do we do all this stuff? Well, we decentralize. Um, so I'm here to basically tell you that Flashbots is here to avoid entrench entrenching centralization, like I said, at every step. Uh, we're here to decentralize power in MEV. We expect the community and the users of these systems to hold us to account. Um, that is why we do what we do and why we build the systems we build, and we expect that to continue to be our North Star. Um, so the next thing we're going to build towards these aims and towards distributing MEV and giving users more access to their value um, is this thing that we've codenamed Suave. 
It stands for the Single Unifying Auction for Value Expression. Uh, it's an MEV-aware encrypted mempool for users and wallets, so it features kind of programmable privacy that users can leverage in negotiations with validators and with other entities on the systems. Um, it features progressive decentralization, so we have an architecture that we believe from day one can be decentralized and will be decentralized, and a series of steps that uh, are pretty clear to kind of get us there. Um, so that's kind of the, the holding us to account part. Um, that's starting to be published now and will keep coming out over the next few weeks. It's also a turnkey decentralized block builder for other domains, other rollups, other chains, et cetera, that uh, want to preserve their decentralization while getting kind of the benefits of MEV. Um, so the properties of this are it's fully decentralized, uh, like I said, open source. All of the development of this is going to be in the open, so stay tuned on our various materials. Uh, we're going to be releasing specs soon, and, and as well as uh, some prototypes, and we look forward to working and engaging with you on actually building these things. Um, it's ETH native, so we're aligned with both the, the ETH blockchain and the EVM. Um, we're looking to provide optimal user execution, so uh, truly optimizing the price users get, giving users the best possible price and the lowest possible fees with an MEV awareness uh, and an MEV aware perspective. Uh, we're going to support, obviously, cross and multi-chains because that kind of unlocks more value for users um, and kind of try to avoid the centralization that we talked about in the Flashbots research paper we wrote on cross-chain MEV. Um, this is the main goal, which is to maximize competition and geographic diversity. This is how we get out of the dark forest of, you know, centralization, censorship, domination, etc. cetera. Um, we want to enable open order flow. So... Towards first party deals, one of the most dangerous directions is the centralization of exclusive order flow, which is what we've seen in TradFi. Uh, you have these large entities that are extremely good at exploiting and extracting rent from privileged uh, kind of broker style information streams. And that's what we really need to avoid for cryptocurrency at all costs. Um, so we're gonna make sure order flow is open and anyone can permissionlessly interact with any order flow that's generated in the system. Um, and of course, programmable privacy, again, is a huge component of uh, how users uh, get value here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end on this slide, even though I have some bonus slides that are gonna have to wait until next time. Uh, but let me cover what I actually promised in the beginning of the presentation um, and uh, the title of the presentation, which is what are the trillion dollar questions in MEV? Um, so to believe these are trillion dollar questions, you have to believe MEV is a trillion dollar problem. Uh, which maybe with FTX is like slightly more dubious than it was last week. Uh, but I still truly do believe that the systems we're going to build and the potential for using technology, privacy, mechanism design, um, computational game theory, all these tools that people in this room are building and working towards to build something better than PFOF, better than Citadel, better than these large opaque entities that just trade against users for rent. Um, I truly believe we can do this. And if we can do this, then MEV is definitely a trillion dollar question uh, because it's just a question of how do we make these systems as aligned with user preferences as possible. So if you suspend your disbelief there and you join my crusade to make all of TradFi run on MEV aware systems within five years, uh, by the way, if you're on the panel later, I'll say it's not gonna be TradFi designing crypto, it's the other way around, I think, uh, but happy to still have you all help. Um, so anyway, what are the trillion dollar questions if you buy the trillion dollar thesis? Number one question is, what is the privacy efficiency frontier? So this is a question of assume users have extremely granular decryption, programmable decryption conditions on their transactions on, say, Ethereum. How much data do they want to reveal and when to get the optimal value for their information flow? So one example is they could reveal absolutely nothing other than whether a transaction succeeded or not to the miner. From like an information theory perspective, that could be just hidden by some cryptography black box, and the miner just doesn't get those bits of data. Um, that does make it harder to kind of harness MEV, reorder and extract this value. So is that really what we want? If you're making a Uniswap trade, could you maybe get more value by revealing that it's a Uniswap trade, or that it's a pool, or something like that? Which token you're trading? So this is a very big open research and mechanism design uh, question. I think we can probably leverage uh, a lot of other auction literature on private information there. Um, okay, what is geographic diversity, how to achieve it, and how does that relate to inclusion and censorship resistance? So I truly believe geographic diversity is the only way to censorship resistance. I don't think privacy is enough. If you're all in the same place, I don't think privacy will buy you censorship resistance. You really need that diversity. 
So how to design L1s and PBS, uh, shout out Barnabé's talk, around this concept of geographic diversity, and how do we make sure the network continues to achieve this? How do we escape SGX? So we're talking about programmable privacy for negotiations here. Trusted hardware is a very convenient way to achieve this and to get some form of decentralization. That being said, it introduces another form of centralization, which is reliance on, on, on the trusted hardware. So how do we escape this? Um, what are the limits of MEV minimization? So this is going to be what my bonus slides were about. But uh, what is the fundamental of MEV and uh, how much do we want? This also wraps in questions about good or bad MEV. Find me afterwards to, to talk about that. And the last one is, what about meta-MEV, MEV of the coordinating layer, MEV of SUAV? SUAV is an auction. SUAV has MEV. Um, so how do you reason about this MEV and align MEV with social welf welfare uh, in general? So we need your help. And please, please, please do reach out. Come participate in our forum. And let's reach the MEV utopia together. All right, I think I maybe have time for negative one question. Uh, so thank you for humoring me. Find me afterwards if, if you don't get in this cut. Thanks. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So uh, I would say on the pro uh, the question was about zero knowledge in MEV and whether we have any plans at Flashbots to integrate zero knowledge um, or, or anything like that. Um, so the answer is it is interesting for sure. Um, zero knowledge is, is a very tricky subject in crypto because a lot of times you don't actually use the zero knowledge and like the privacy part and like where to apply the privacy part given like the fact that you need a lot of state to be public also isn't like immediately clear. So there's a lot of work around private uh, blockchains that kind of deal with these questions uh, still unanswered. I think we are interested. We're definitely doing research on like all privacy technologies, MPC, homomorphic encryption, um, TEs, SGX, et cetera, and zero knowledge as well. Um, I do think eventually there may be some application right now um, it, the proofs are just too slow to generate. Like these are all real time kind of systems that people do want to be fast. Um, so like to prevent geographic centralization, maybe we need to accept like a 15 second block time because there's a seven second like partial synchrony assumption on the internet. But maybe like we can't just have one round of zero knowledge in our negotiation, right? So like we'd really need a one hour block time to have decentralized zero knowledge. Um, so I think bringing that down a lot obviously is something everyone wants across the board and maybe when some of the other less zero knowledge but still snark projects like starkware um kind of optimize that more maybe we can use those technologies uh yeah so we're looking into it we're doing research no plans on the product side right now mostly because of latency is the tldr all right thank you everyone <laughs>